Hey, Lynn Valley Church family, welcome once again to another uh, other 316 uh, in Scripture. As you recall, uh, last time we looked at First or Second Timothy 316, and as we back up a little bit in the New Testament, this week we'll look at First uh, Timothy 316. And here we uh, find here in the New Testament uh, a passage of Scripture that encloses uh, the concept, I guess you want to call it that, the mystery and the majesty of our Christian faith. Uh, and the passage reads this way. Beyond all question, the mystery from which true godliness springs is great. He appeared in the flesh, was vindicated by the Spirit, was seen by angels, was preached among the nations, was believed on in the world, was taken up in glory. And of course, if we uh, read that passage of Scripture, we find that that pretty much kind of gives us the Bible as far as what the Bible is about. It's enclosed right there in that passage of Scripture as far as um, um, being able to uh, have a divine message for uh, what... Uh, being in Christ means um, and of course we understand that this is part of uh, uh, Paul's letter his first letter to uh, Timothy who was a young leader in the early church Christian church and uh, there's some key elements as far as the Christian uh, confession here that we need to look at and um, when we look at this epistle uh, it's uh, one of the pastoral epistles uh, uh, the last, same as uh, Second Timothy that was written to Paul's protege uh, and uh, uh, we understand that, remember, that Timothy was tasked with leading the church in Ephesus. Uh, Ephesus was a city that was known at that time for its uh, diverse and uh, uh, groupings of people and its uh, presence of various religious practices was going on there. So Paul was writing to Timothy to instruct him on how to manage church affairs and how to address false teachings and how to promote uh, sound doctrine and uh, godly living amongst the believers. Uh, the whole of chapter 3 uh, is kind of provides us some qualifications uh, for church leaders as far as overseers and deacons and pastors uh, and there's uh, an emphasis here on the importance of character and integrity in people uh, as far as those that are leaders in the church and then Paul uh, after he looks at these qualifications, he transitions to this statement. Uh, you might even call it a, a, a doxology statement uh, in verse 16 that, like I said, celebrates the core truths of the Christian faith. Now, the verse begins with this uh, acknowledgement of the profound nature of uh, our Christian message, and that is that beyond all question, the mystery from which true God in the springs is great. And this term mystery here is... Uh, in the New Testament often refers to a divine truth that was once hidden but is now being uh, revealed. And here's one of the, I guess, probably one of the foundational truths of Christianity that should inspire and cultivate uh, true godliness in all believers. Uh, there are some uh, uh, scholars that believe that this chat verse of Scripture, 3.16 in 1 Timothy, may, may have been at one time an early Christian hymn uh, or a creed used in worship to uh, express uh, key truths about Christ. Uh, and uh, But whether it was or not, it doesn't really matter because the verse is also structured here with uh, six uh, declarative statements about uh, Jesus Christ. Uh, and each one of them highlights a different aspect of uh, his person and his work. It says here that he appeared in the flesh. And of course this affirms the incarnation uh, of Christ, which is the belief that he is the uh, eternal son of God and he took on a human nature. And uh, this is once again foundational to our Christian walk. Uh, that Christ was not only God but he was also fully man and that he experienced human life and suffering and he did all this without sin and uh, so we have to you know that's incorporated here in this passage of scripture it also says he was vindicated by the spirit and this refers likely to uh, uh, reference here to Jesus' resurrection where the Holy Spirit uh, vindicated or justified his claims and his works by raising him from the dead and uh, this, uh, uh, the resurrection of Christ is once again central to our faith because it demonstrates that Jesus, you know, uh, had victory over hell, death, and the grave, and that uh, uh, we see that this will once again give affirmation to his divinity. Um, and it also says that he was seen by angels. Now, angels played a 
significant role uh, in Jesus' life and ministry. You recall that angels announced his birth. Uh, angels ministered minister to him after uh, his temptation uh, in the wilderness. And they were also present at his resurrection and the ascension. Uh, so this highlights an acknowledgement from heaven that uh, Jesus' mission here on earth was valid and that it was um, ordained by God the Father. It also says that he was preached among the nations. Uh, so after his resurrection, uh, Christ commissioned the disciples to uh, spread the gospel to all nations. He says for you to go uh, to all the nations, teaching and preaching. Now, a lot of people read that passage of scripture, they think that they're supposed to do all of those things. Uh, I think there's only, uh, I had a pastor once explain to me that uh, in that passage of scripture, there's only one thing in that passage of scripture that I can do, and that's go. Uh, everything after the go is done by the Holy Spirit uh, that through God the Father and Jesus the Son uh, and that I have to just you know just be willing to go and so um, uh, this there was some initial uh, opposition and persecution in the Christian church uh, but eventually the the message of Jesus took root uh, in various cultures and uh, has uh, you know progressed to what it is today and lastly, it says uh, he was taken up, uh, I'm sorry, not lastly, but he was believed on in the world. Uh, this acknowledges that there was a spread of the gospel and acceptance of the Christian faith uh, throughout the world uh, through many different populations. Um, and uh, so it also says he was taken up into glory. Uh, this refers to his ascension uh, into heaven where he is exalted today and sits at the right hand of the God the Father. And this ascension also uh, uh, basically signifies that there's a completion of Christ's earthly ministry as far as he's concerned and that his ongoing reign and intercession for us as believers is taking place. So when um, we're told in scripture that uh, he sits on the right hand of the Father making intercession for us, uh, that's a part of our faith that, that we uh, accept and know that it's a wonderful thing to, to have happen for us uh, as far as Christians are concerned. Um, and I guess as far as a practical application for this uh, passage of scripture uh, for all of us as believers uh, this is a reminder to us that there are some uh, some core beliefs of as far as our faith is concerned uh, we have to as believers embrace the mystery uh, that uh, we have here in scripture the incarnation and the resurrection of Christ were miraculous events and uh, they uh, can invite uh, wonder and worship into our hearts and our life each and every day just by thinking about those things. Uh, as far as pro uh, proclaiming the gospel, there's this, um, all Christians are called to, uh, you know, deliver the message of Christ to everyone, whomever you meet. Uh, and we are to share this message verbally uh, and also within our life as far as how we live. Um, and we can see that in our daily life that there's a transforming power uh, in the magic and the power uh, and the majesty of his word. Uh, we can live in hope uh, and assurance that the resurrection and ascension of Christ uh, uh, gives us some confidence that we can live with this knowing that he has conquered hell, death, and the grave as I said before and that in essence uh, his sovereignty is God's sovereignty is the Holy Spirit's sovereignty uh, three in one that they are all sovereign in nature and as far as the, we can also cultivate godliness in our heart and our life because this is a doctrinal truth as well as a practical reality that we are all called as believers to live lives that reflect the character of Christ. Uh, that's what it means by being Christ-like um, and that we can grow in righteousness and holiness as we follow him each and every day. So to wrap this up, uh, this passage of scripture here in Second First uh, Timothy three sixteen, uh, once again, uh, you know, it just uh, gives us an opportunity to reflect on the truths of the scripture and allows us to uh, shape our lives and to uh, can, we can live out our lives with this mystery of godliness and with this confidence and and a conviction in our heart and our life, and that we can uh, go out into the world and proclaim the gospel, and that at the same time we can grow in our Christ likeness. You know that. That's what his, ha, having a life in Christ is all about, is, in, is enclosed right here in this passage of scripture in 1 Timothy 3.16. Is that where you are today in your walk? I pray that it is. We'll see you next time with another Other 3.16.